This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here are your hosts, Jeff Deist and Dr. Bob Murphy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast, joined as always by my co-host, Dr. Bob Murphy. How you doing, Bob? I'm doing all right, Jeff. How are you? How's your money sleeping at night in the bank down there in Florida? Is it rolling over and tossing and turning? <laughs> Yes, and it's not growing either. So, Well, obviously, the big story continues, which is what's happening in the banking sector. We've been touching on Silicon Valley Bank, uh, some of the possible bailouts, some of the moral hazards of FDIC, what the Fed is doing with its loan swap program and otherwise. But I thought this week we might elaborate on last week's show by actually walking through some of the mechanics or some of the terminology of how banks could work or perhaps should work from our perspective, because we've been talking a lot about how bad the Fed is, um, how bad uh, fiat money is, how bad fiduciary media is, but there's a whole uh, way of looking at this from a fundamental or conceptual way. And, and I think the best place to start, Bob, is probably uh, Mises' theory of money and credit, which is over 100 years old now, but still mm -hmm. an unbelievable book. Uh, Rothbard called it the best book about money ever written. And of course, you wrote the study guide to that, which is available at Mises.org. It's your handy-dandy uh, cliff notes for the theory of money and credit. And you know, I, I guess it's in part three of that book where he gets into what he calls the business of banking. And sometimes I think as uh, critics of the Fed we sort of uh, gloss over a lot of uh, terminology, a lot of mechanics as to what banks actually do. So let, let's just talk about that part of Mises for a little bit. I think the audience would benefit. So, so to start with, when it comes to banking practices, Mises makes a distinction between what he calls commodity credit and circulation credit. You don't hear that too much anymore, but can you just walk us through that? Well, sure. So I think the reason he, he picked those terms because they're kind of odd, it has to do with his focus on what's called commodity money, you know, which is, of course, hard money that is, was originally commodity. So in his terminology, commodity credit means that the, the person making the loan, you know, so it has to do with borrowing, but that credit is granted because there's a genuine saver who's genuinely renouncing present goods in order to, you know, free up the resources that are then being lent to the borrower. So commodity, there's nothing wrong or um, unsustainable or illegitimate about commodity credit, whereas circulation credit in the Misesian framework means that um, it, it's based on fiduciary media, which maybe we'll define in a second, too. And it, it means that there's somebody's being granted credit. And so they're able to borrow. They're able to invest in you know, their production process, what have you. But there's not someone else in the economy you can point to to say, oh, they had income that they chose to save and they're renouncing present consumption, that it's, you know, sort of this loose joint. Well, and so and it that ties in Mises had a whole, you know, he called it the circulation credit theory of the trade cycle. So mm -hmm. nowadays we just call that, you know, Austrian business cycle theory. But in Mises terminology, he called it the circulation credit theory of the trade cycle, because that's what he thought was the essence okay. of his explanation. So in modern banking, we think of we think of a one year CD. Right, you're giving up the the ability to consume that money for 12 months, uh, and you can't take it out without a penalty. And, and in exchange, you get a, a certain amount of interest paid. So we can understand that as a time deposit. But of course, most mm -hmm. banking, in terms of checking and savings accounts in retail banks, average people is is demand deposits, which means that you put your money in and it circulates immediately. Now you can call that loan in effect by going and making withdrawal at any time, but everybody can't call their loan at the same time. So is that, I mean, is that the, is that the present analogy, uh, time deposits and demand deposits? Yeah, I, th I think so. And it, I mean, it's more specifically that, it, you know, the loans um, for commodity credit are, you know, genuinely backed up by money that, it, like you say, it, it's not being used by somebody else. They're, they're renouncing their ability to command present goods. Um, it, uh, there, Mises also in theory of money and credit, he has a, an interesting thing where he refers to the golden rule of banking that has to, I don't remember the exact way he put it, but it has to do with matching the maturities of your assets and liabilities. And so, so yes, like in principle, if you're, if the bank's going to fund a 30 year mortgage, then 
they should be getting 30 year CD, you know, the, the lender should be buying 30 year CDs and other, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, so the, the principle, even if some, you know, you're taking 12 month CDs and then you're using them to fund 30 year mortgages in, you know, in principle, you could be in trouble that when that year comes up and those people want their money back, plus the interest on the one year CD, you know, you're assuming if you're the bank, oh, we'll just roll it over and issue a new one year CD. But so even there, there could be issues, but the, you know, the, the logical extension of that or the, you know, the supreme conclusion of that would be what is done right now today with banking, where people put in their money, they think it's immediately available. You're checking, you know, what's my checking account balance. It says I have $800 in there, but most of that actually has been lent out to other borrowers. And so, yes, that the, the nature of the banking system right now is incredibly focused on this mismatch between of uh, borrow short and lend long. So in your study guide, you mentioned that Rothbard uses the terms loan banking versus deposit banking. And loan banking here, the analogy is commodity credit. Deposit banking, the analogy is circulation credit or, or fractional reserve banking. So is, is there a nuance or a difference that we should see between uh, Rothbard's taxonomy and Mises's, or are they getting at the same thing? It's As far as I can remember, there, that's an exact correspondence. It's just different labels. I think Rothbard's uh, terminology is a, bit, is a little bit clearer, like easier to remember, because... Um, what he, what he's getting at the essence is that, um, you know, so, so banking being, you know, the function of taking money from one group of people and giving it to another one. So loan banking means that the people you're getting the money from are lending it to the bank. Mm -hmm. And then the bank in turn is lending it to somebody else and they earn a spread, you know, if the interest rates are different and the bank is, you know, performing its role as a credit intermediary, whereas deposit banking is the first group of people, the, the savers, they don't think they're lending their money to the bank. They think, no, I'm making a deposit at the bank. So just even that terminology is different, right? If you're if you're buying a one year CD, you don't think, oh, I made a deposit. You're saying, no, I made an investment or I lent the money or I bought a CD. But if you put money in a checking account, you think I deposited it should be there next Tuesday when I go to the grocery right. store because right. it's deposited. So I think that's why Rothbard used that terminology to to really get at the essence of how the public thinks about it. If you made a deposit. You think it's sitting there waiting for you and you could take it back. Whereas to make a loan, everybody realizes, oh, well, you don't have it right now because you lent it out. And of course, generally speaking, when you make a demand deposit, your money is there next Tuesday when you go to the grocery. So I think uh, Americans are, have gotten quite comfortable with that. And, and we haven't had, I guess, serious bank runs in this country since... Well, maybe you could say 2008 was a bank crisis, but not really bank runs. Uh, maybe the the Keatings, the, the savings and loans in the late 80s, but nothing like the 30s. And so right. very few people today are alive who have lived through that, unless perhaps they came from a you know a foreign country, which has experienced uh, maybe hyperinflation or something like that. So we can understand why most people are, are comfortable with this, even if they don't fully understand it. But let's define fiduciary media, because when we make a deposit, uh, when a bank issues circulation credit, so we use deposit banking and circulation credit as synonyms here, Mises and Rothbard, uh, the bank issues fiduciary media or, or unbacked money substitutes. So what exactly is fiduciary media? Sure. So in the Misesian terminology, um, I'll, I'll say some other labels too, or terms, uh, you know, imagine that there's gold coins circulating and that's the actual money. Well, that can be inconvenient. And so one of the functions that the bank performs is you go and deposit those clunky gold coins and then they give you pieces of paper. So if those things were backed up 100 percent, you know, in the vault, Mises would call that um, a money certificate. So it would also be a money substitute, right, because the money's the gold coin. But the piece of paper that the community accepts at par, everybody trusts that bank. They know that, oh, yeah, this piece of paper I could go turn it in. I know for sure I'm getting a gold coin back. So the paper trades at par with the gold coins. So it's a money substitute. But then within that class, Mises says it's a money certificate if it's backed up 100% by gold coins in the vault or silver, whatever the money is. But if it's not, to the extent that the bank only has you know 100 of those gold coins in the vault, but they've issued 110 of those pieces of paper, just you know thinking on any given day, not more than 101 people are going to show up to demand it, so we're fine then um, the excess, the, the amount of those certificates that were or substitutes that were issued above the backing that the banks have in reserve, that's f called fiduciary media. So, that, so that's unbacked money in the broader sense, to use another one of Mises' terms, 
that the banks effectively create. So that's the sense in which the banking system creates money in a very real sense, so just it, by the act of it, granting loans. Okay, so banks create money in the broader sense, in other words, in terms of deposits. They don't create money in the narrow sense. The narrowest is M0, which is literally physical cash and currency. And I guess M1 adds uh, some, some time deposits. But... Well, and, and demand and deposits. And demand deposits, that's right. But in other words, right. so banks don't create money, but they create credit. You hear that a lot. But in a sense, when they issue fiduciary media and that shows up in you know, um, someone's bank account, let's say a business's bank account, as some additional zeros, um, in, the, in the broader measure of money, like an M3 measure of money, uh, that's included. But you don't even have to go even an M1 though. Right. Like so, um, so so yeah. Like if you think of it back in the day when there's gold and silver coins, then it's real easy that the you know the pieces of paper that are claims that you know claim tickets to get the gold coins, the banks aren't creating more gold just by their operations, but they can make more pieces of paper. So if the pieces of paper circulate in the community equivalent to the gold coins, that's the sense in which the banks can create money. In our time, it's a little bit weird because the the base money itself is just a piece of paper that's nothing, you know, quote, real. But but yeah, so if money that's issued by the Federal Reserve, you know, the pieces of green pieces of paper with, um, you know, 20 is written on them and pictures of dead presidents, if that's the legal tender base money, right, the Bank of America can't legally print more of those. But what it can do is somebody, you know, takes a hundred dollar bill and goes and hands it and deposits in Bank of America. So their checking account goes up by a hundred dollars. But now Bank of America, if they grant somebody else a loan for $90 and they just credit their checking account. So in a, in a, if M1 consists of adding up everybody's checking account balances, which it does, then M1 just went up $90 by Bank of America doing that. So the amount of green pieces of paper didn't go up. But because someone put a $100 bill in Bank of America's vault, that person's checking account balance went up 100 And then if Bank of America gives somebody else a $90 loan by, in the first step, crediting their account by $90 you know, just following the operations, how do you calculate M1? It really did just go up. Mm-hmm. And then M2 and M3 and all the higher ones too. So that is the sense. So yes, it's, it's a, when you say, can banks create money? You will say, do you have to define, what do you mean? So in Mises' terminology, yeah, money in the narrower sense, no, but money in the broader sense, yes. But in your example, where a bank has, let's say, 100 gold coins and is issued certificates for 105 of them, that's not really how it is. It's more like they have five gold coins and they've issued certificates for 100, right? So I don't hear the term fiduciary media used much anymore. Do, do mainstream economists, do monetary economists, do Fed officials use this term? Because it, it, in other words, the fiduciary media, the unbacked money substitutes really are the money today. We all understand that you know US dollars are no mm. longer redeemable in gold, even by foreign governments or foreign holders. So it is a fiat currency in the sense that it's unbacked. It can be issued politically. Um, so does fiduciary media only almost become a meaningless term? Because in, in a sense, I guess what I'm getting at is it's almost synonymous for what we know of as money. I mean, very little of what we know of as money is actual physical dollars or coins. And none of what we know of as money is, is redeemable for anything other than those dollars and coins. Yeah, I think you're right. That So you asked a few things there. Um, I have never seen an economist use the term fiduciary media who is not coming out of the Austrian tradition. Really? Okay. Yeah. I'm not saying they don't. I'm just saying I, you know, and now there could be a selection bias since most of what I read is from Austrians. But um, yeah, I can't remember. Like um, you and I both are aware of that, that publication. Um, was it the Chicago Fed put out decades ago? Understanding was, Money you know, Mechanics. Pretty trans- yeah, pretty clear that it was, you know, it's one of the inspirations for the book I did for the Mises Institute. Um, I could be wrong. I don't remember them using that term. All right, like I said, I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't wow, remember that's, them using that. So that's pretty incredible if we think about it, because one of the, uh, you know, one of the baseline Austrian arguments is the fact that uh, there's so much of this is unbacked. Uh, so much mm-hmm. of this can be uh, ratcheted up is what creates... Uh, dislocations in the economy, what creates the bad political incentives for governments mm-hmm. to inflate, uh, and what sets off a business cycle which must come to an end someday. So it just seems, it just strikes me as strange that 
this concept doesn't seem to exist, or at least isn't used regularly outside of the Austrian what, school. I that mean, strikes so me as a problem. To be clear, yeah, I mean, they, I can't think off the top of my head what their term would be. So I'm not saying they don't even take account of the fact that, hey, there's unbacked deposits in the banking system. I'm just saying that I, I'm pretty sure they don't call it fiduciary media. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right beyond. And also, too, yeah, I think for people who are younger, and like including myself, growing up in an era of genuine fiat money where there wasn't even the pretense, you know, because even as of 1960, the average American couldn't turn in dollars for, for gold. Only other central banks could. Um, but yeah, even once that final little semblance of the gold standard was killed, it does seem like, hey, it's all fake anyway. Who cares? It's all monopoly money kind of deal. But I mean, strictly speaking, there are legal distinctions that, um, you know, why were people worried about SVP going under is because if they made a bunch of promises and then, oops, sorry, and it collapsed, then that there's a sense in which that money disappeared, whereas $100 bills don't just poof, go van, you know, disappear that in that sense. So even with the money being fiat paper currency, you know, that the government just sort of declares, there still is a distinction that unbacked deposits in the banks are uh, even less tangible than that because, yeah, they can, if the bank goes under, technically it's just you're a creditor of the bank right. when you make a deposit, legally right. speaking. Yeah, even though that's not how people are thinking about it, they're like, no, I put my money in there and it's, you know, you owe me the $200. I say, yeah, we owe it to you. Just like a regular business, if you lend money to a business and they go under, they might not pay you back or they might not pay you back, you know, 100 cents to the dollar that, that they owe you. That's what happens to your balances. So there's a, that's, you know, there, that's a difference. Um, but but you're right. And, and, and I think it is worth stressing that the Austrians are, it, it's a little bit weird because it's on the one hand, I, I, th I told you this off air, uh, Joe, I was at Texas Tech. I won't name the economist, but there was a, a grad student who was giving a presentation that was informed by the Rothbarding approach. And it had to do with the idea of, you know, hundred percent reserve bank. And there was an economist who was very smart guy. And he just sort of was like, doesn't Rothbard know how banks work? Like he was mystified the idea that, you know, somebody could have a problem with banks doing deposit mm -hmm. banking in Rothbard's terminology, you know, borrowing short and lending. He thought that was the essence of banking was to borrow short and lend long. And I, th I think we talked about that's the diamond dip big model. You know, they, they think that's what banks do. And so the Austrians coming, some Austrians, obviously some Austrians don't have a problem with this, but people, especially in the Rothbardian tradition or, you know, Mises saying this is the cause of the business cycle. Um, that is somewhat unique. But on the other hand, I don't want to just leave it at that because there's a thing called the Chicago plan. If people go Google that, it was in 1933, I believe, a bunch of Chicago school economists seeing what just happened in the great, you know, early stages of what we call the Great Depression, all the bank runs. They said, you know, if if there was a 100 percent reserve requirement, then this kind of thing wouldn't happen. And so they were actually in favor. So this isn't some weird, crankish Rothbardian position. But in the modern time, even a lot of economists just think that, oh, yeah, banks have to do this when no, they don't. Well, it seems like it's the essence today, but let's talk about this. Hypothetically speaking, counterfactual, how, what might banking look like, let's say, if there were no FDIC created in, I think, 1934, uh, the Fed itself created in 1913. Um, you know, we have a history in this country of, of far more small banks. There used to be 30 some thousand odd banks in the United States a little over 100 years ago. Now there's only about 4,000. So that's dropped dramatically. There's been a lot of centralization. And a lot of what we call small banks today would probably be big banks by the standards of 100 years ago. Um, but how might banking operate in some kind of full reserve system? What might that look like? Sure. So there, there's two main proposals I've seen you know, in recent years. So one model is just the, the genuine money warehouse. And this is the, you know, related to the idea of, of Caitlin Long. And maybe we'll talk about her in a minute. But yeah, it just the, the principle of it is that what the bank does, I mean, it's a genuine service, just like, you know, if you want to go have valuable things stored somewhere, mm -hmm. they can go ahead and do that for you. And here it's it's a money and money is fungible. And so if I give it to this central in institution and they have things set up all over the country, we call them ATMs, you know, that's a valuable service and they can keep it. And if I want to write checks or swipe a debit card somewhere. So there's nothing in principle that says, oh, yeah, you can't have that happen unless they lend your stuff out to others. But of course, they have to get paid for setting up that infrastructure and giving you such convenience. And so 
you know, they would charge you a fee. Now, whether it would be a small percentage of your overall balance every month or whether it would be a flat fee, you know, who knows? Let, let the market figure that out. But the idea is just surely some people would be in the market and be willing to pay a small fee to have this institution just keep their money safe and, and not lend it out to other people. And so, yeah, you couldn't earn interest on those accounts, but why couldn't you have that? You know, And so that's one proposal. Another one is what's called a narrow bank. And that has to, you know, in the era now where the Fed's been paying the, the big banks interest on reserves, this group of people came up with the idea and said, okay, well, why can't we, you know, give some to the little guy and we'll just set up in a, a bank, we'll call it a narrow bank, meaning this is all it does. It doesn't get into all these other things like grant and mortgages and stuff. And it takes, you know, our deposits and then it goes and parks them at the Fed and the Fed pays interest on reserves. And then it flows that the narrow bank flows that through to its customers. You know, so some part of the interest earnings from the Fed, it uses to pay the bills, to keep the lights on and pay the, you know, the tellers or whatever. But other than that, that's that's all it does. And, and the function, of course, would be to have a safe place for people to keep their money where they know it's good because, the, you know, the Fed isn't going to default on them. It's it's just sitting there parked at the Fed. So even if tomorrow everybody showed up and wanted their money, the narrow bank could satisfy all claimants because their money's sitting there parked electronically at the Fed. So that, that's a, a different example too. it. You know, in the more modern framework, given the realities of how the U S is operating a proposal that, that would be run, that would be run proof too. Well, in that second scenario though, I believe you would need a master account with Fed in order to do well, that. Well, right. And so in practice, that's the, the roadblock they hit. And, you know, we can link to on this episode, there's a, a good article John Cochran wrote up saying like the safe bank that the Fed wouldn't approve or something. And the people, so like you say, yeah, they applied. It was supposed to be a real open and shut. You know, they they checked all the boxes for the kind of depository institution that should have been able to get the master account. And the Fed just kept de delaying, delaying. And they, I think they actually brought them to court, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the company saying, why are you doing And the Fed just kept saying, well, because, you know, we're worried about the policy implications and da, 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 and so some people are thinking they, they were just worried that once this option became available, if it did, lots of people would pull their money out of the other banks that were risky and just plop it into this thing. And the Fed maybe didn't want that happening for various reasons. So, I mean, that's speculation, but for sure, had this thing been up and running. And so like when SVP went down, there were a bunch of sob stories of people. I don't mean to belittle it by calling it that, but people coming to say, this isn't, this isn't just, you know, tech bros. This is like some school, their payroll was in SVP. It, and so sure. I think that kind of shows that when the free banker guys come along and make fun of Rothbard and say, hey, there's nothing stopping this right now. They're, you know, people don't want that. The market's spoken. I think that's wrong. Certainly now after what just happened, I, I imagine plenty of employers who are, you know, using the banking system partly to keep track of pay or to, you know, handle their payroll would like a place where they could put three months of payroll and not have to worry that it's going to be gone. And yeah, I'm not earning interest on that, but that's fine because this isn't an investment. I'm not doing this to make money to, you know, make my um, report to the shareholders look better. This is just where we're parking the payroll. So we don't have to worry that we got to lay people off in case there's a hiccup in the banking system. Well, so in your first scenario, not the narrow bank, but the truly custodial bank, I mean, obviously, let's mm -hmm. say a very wealthy person would pay for a service. And in today's context, most uh, dollar wealth would be in electronic form, not in physical currency form. So in a sense, instead of having a safety deposit box in the analog world, in a, in a guarded, gated bank with all kinds of alarms and bars uh, and, and you know, steel bars around it, you, you might pay for a bank to effectively house your digital dollars you know, on their server, or their cloud, which is somehow more secured against attack or malware or uh, you know ID theft or whatever it might be, than a system you could easily have at home individually, right? And and of course, most wealthy people don't want to have hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in cash in their home. That doesn't sound mm -hmm. too fun. Uh, so you you could you could certainly see the market for it. And unlike the old days, you can be very 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 wealthy and just have a small apartment and a bank account. You don't have to have land holdings and inventory right. and, and factories and farms. You don't have to physically own all kinds of stuff. You can just own electronically a lot of cash and electronically a lot of 
you know, stocks or bonds or whatever it might be. So we can see warehousing, even in the digital context, would be popular from a cybersecurity standpoint and that people would be willing to pay for that. Uh, so that doesn't strike me as unusual. But um, I believe that Custodia Bank, which was started by Caitlin uh, to the, the aforementioned Caitlin Long, who's a friend of ours, uh, in, in order to avail itself of some Wyoming uh, crypto-friendly uh, banking laws, which she helped create at the legislative level. Uh, but also, her, de- her design was to be a full reserve bank, as a matter of fact, to hold more than a dollar in assets for all of, you know, like a dollar and eight cents for every dollar deposited. And she, she on the Custodia Bank, made an appeal to, or an application to the Fed for a master account was turned down. And if you read the sort of brief, terse um, Fed report on that, they said, well, you know, crypt- uh, cryptocurrency creates a lot of uh, systemic risk and it has the possibility for fraud and uh, drug dealing and things like that. So uh, not so easy to just start a full reserve bank, as you might think, because if you want access to that Fed master account to do all kinds of transactions, including potentially getting paid interest on reserves, uh, then you're out of luck. Right. So I I think that that those two examples do show, and, and it was also very ironic, right? Because her denial came just a little bit before you know all the SVP collapse yes, and stuff. So exactly. she's sort of a you know a hero in hard money circles, uh, you know, on, on Twitter right now, and people you know pointing at her as a as a poster child of this stuff. That you know she, she she was trying to to warn people that sort of thing. So I think yeah the, the, it does show um, it's a little bit obtuse for so for people who don't understand you know some of the backstory here. So within even Austrian circles, there's a dispute over fractional reserve banking. In fact, it's one of the biggest disputes when the Austrians want to go to war with each other. And um, there's like the 100 percent reservists that are in the Rothbardian tradition for sure. And I would argue, you know, Mises himself, it's a little bit hard to classify him, but he definitely thought the business cycle was due to fractional reserve banking. Again, that's why I say he called it the circulation credit theory of the trade cycle. So it wasn't just, oh, if it's not, you know, if the government encourages it and makes it above the optimal amount. No, he thought per se, I would argue what we call fractional reserve banking caused the boom bust cycle in his framework. Um, But then there's guys who call themselves the free bankers and they're saying just as long as you don't have government subsidies for it or things like FDIC that artificially mm-hmm. encourage it, let the market decide. And if you know banks want to hold three percent reserves and that's the market outcome, who cares? You know, so be it. That's efficient. So, what like I say, one of their pretty good points had been rhetorically to say, look at nobody. It's not illegal to have a hundred percent reserve bank right now. Nobody's stopping you. Why don't you just go do it? Oh, I don't see one existing. It must be the people don't want it. And as Custodia Bank and this narrow bank proposal show, actually, it's it's not it's it's more complicated than that because yet in today's world, if the Fed is not going along with it, your your ability to be a you know a useful service for clients that might be all over the world and want to be able to move their money around, but know that it's always there electronically. Um, if the Fed's not going along with that, it's, it is hampering what you're able to do. Well, we can all understand in a, in a purely free economy, if a bank wanted to openly advertise, look, make, you know, do your banking here. We're going to lend out 90% of what you deposit. You may not be able to get it at any given time, but we're going to pay you 15% interest a year because we're going to go out and invest or, or uh, um, dabble in all kinds of things like emerging markets or cryptocurrencies which have wide swings or whatever it might be and that was fully disclosed i mean if that's free banking i don't think anyone listening to the show would want to ban it but i suggest that it's awfully hard to base a system of free banking off of a fiat or government controlled currency in other words these free banks um, aren't issuing their own private competing currencies like we might want yeah there's that element and like you say it's um you know, with the existence of FDIC, and then we've even seen how the Fed's willing to come in and even go above and beyond that and do these things. So it's uh, it certainly isn't an open and fair field of competition that the banks that are doing the sort of thing you're talking about, Jeff, do have the government. Again, the, the, the ostensible rationale for creating the Fed in the first place was not to smooth out the business cycle. 
No, it was to be a lender of last resort because the panic in 1907, they thought, oh, we don't want a bunch of private financiers to be able to call the shots. You know, when there's another panic, we got to have, you know, a public institution that, you know, keeps the the public's interest in mind and and rescues firms that just, you know, are uh, illiquid but solvent. And so, um, again, the, the Fed's ostensible rationale purpose is to rescue firms that get caught with their pants, banks that get caught with their pants down. And so that does tilt the, the you know, things in favor of the, of that institution where, so the, the appeal, you know, in, in normal times, if you've got one bank that says we can't pay you interest, in fact, we got to charge you 0.1% on your deposits with us, but you don't have to worry no matter how bad things get your money's there rock solid. And some other bank is saying, Oh, we'll pay you 2% of your interest and give you, you know, other freebies and things like that. But yeah, we lend it out, but don't worry because the central bank's there to bail us out in case we get into trouble. Well, then that that tilts things in favor of that second option. Well, so past crises have given us things like the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. I have heard Elizabeth Warren and some other uh, politicians calling to increase the FDIC limit. Uh, where do you think this goes from a political political or regulatory standpoint, what do you think this means for banks? Are they going to be bailed out, whether literally or, you know, potentially? And are they going to continue? Are we going to see any changes in the bank system? Is there possibly like a cyberpunk Bitcoin or or gold bug revolution out there? Will we do actually see the market produce some, some full reserve banks? I think all of the above. Um, So I think that certainly people have were really spooked by this and like i say but more yeah. so than any time in my lifetime or you know that i've been paying attention to this stuff the case for you know, regular people in the financial sector who don't you know they're not ideological they don't care about they don't know what austrian economics is even but they realize that yeah there should be a place that firms can put their payroll and not have to worry about something cuz the thing again to, to underscore we mentioned this when we did the episode devoted to svp they weren't doing anything crazy in terms of like they weren't dabbling in uh, pork belly futures or something. They were invested in treasuries. It was just, oh, they were long term. And then the Fed rate hikes maybe were more aggressive than they were anticipating or something. You know, that that's what killed them. And so it's uh, I think more people right now realize, yeah, there should be an option where we, we don't have to do a bunch of research. And then even if we did do research that we could still be wrong because some crazy thing could happen. Um, and then, oops, our payroll disappears. Uh, so I see that. And then, you know, they're private sector people, obviously people involved in blockchain are all scrambling to try to come up with this thing, you know, because you can't just do it in Bitcoin next Thursday because that's too volatile for everybody who's living in a dollar world or euro world, whatever. But I, yes, people in the DeFi world or space are trying to come up with stuff, solutions for that. But also, and this is something I see George Gammon stressing this. Um, you know him, Jeff? He's the rebel capitalist guy. He's making the case that they're going to push for a central bank digital currency, a CBDC. And that I think the argument goes like this. The Fed right now is basically backstopping every depositor, saying, oh, forget the FDIC limits. The Fed's got you. And then we're going to get everyone used to, oh, well, thank goodness. I feel better now knowing that the Fed, like... You don't want the Fed just rescuing the big the big boys like every citizen should have that backstop. Right. Mm-hmm. And then it's not too hard to go from that to why doesn't every person just have a checking account right with the Fed? And then, well, that's kind of what a CBDC is. Right. Just have the Fed run everything. So that's I think kind of where he's he's concerned that they're using this crisis and rescue to make everybody sort of fall open arms, you know, into the to the Fed waiting and willing there to, to cushion the blow. And then, oops, next thing you know, is everybody's just their money, their their checking account is directly tied to the Fed. And then, of course, you know, with all the dangers there that, oops, if you do something naughty, they can just shut off your bank account. They don't even have to arrest you. They don't got to charge you with anything. Just turn off your money and oops. <laughs> well, increasingly you use the term DeFi, the decentralized finance people who are active on Twitter. But I do know that Caitlin Long has been talking about how many TradFi, traditional finance people, have been hitting her up on LinkedIn so clearly mm-hmm. people are worried about this. You mentioned perhaps more than any other time in our lives. And so who knows? In 1985, if you had said that the former Soviet Union was going to collapse in a few years, you would have laughed off of the public stage. So we don't know what's going to happen, what banking and finance is going to look like in five or 10 years. But we do know that there's nothing new under the sun 
other than technology. Human nature doesn't change, and the nature of economics laws don't change. So get back to the source. There's no book better than The Theory of Money and Credit by Ludwig von Mises. If you don't want to read that, you can get the study guide from Bob and and uh, skim through it a lot more quickly. And so we're going to keep an eye on this, and we will be back with another show next week. Thanks so much, Bob. Thanks, Jeff. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.